difference. One cup at a time. Yeah, this is tea time. Make a difference. One cup at a time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Tea time. Make a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back. And you know what that means. It means it's tea time to serve real life stories and words. That's what Miss Liz serves. I do not serve a beverage on Tea Time with Miss Liz. Yes, we do drink tea once in a while from time to time, but we serve a different type of tea at, on this platform. So before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Ring that little doorbell so you can see these tea times at any time, morning, afternoon, evening, or you can join the live streams when we're going live and if you have any questions or comments you can put those into the section or you can actually send miss liz your questions through my facebook page so tonight i have gary Whit griff in in the house and he's going to be sharing his see your name at streamer.com please be advised that the content the content Brought forward for any team, however, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are participants are responsible for using their good judgment and take is an inventor with six patents, international, internationally published researcher, military intelligence veteran developer, social, social tech, explorer, cyclist, hiker, outdoorsman, and an author of seven, including two in his Relating to Ancient series, Cultures, and the Mysterious Agent Changing It, and learning as it influenced to the North Pole, Alaska, which released his first travel adventure article. He and his wife, Patricia, live and travel from South Dakota. So let me get Gary in here and let's spill some tea. Well, thank you, Liz. Thank you for the good introduction. Well, it is a pleasure to have you here. And you know what? I've had Santa Claus on Tea Time, so now we're going to talk about the North Pole on how people ride the bike there. <laughs> Well, yeah, North Pole, Alaska. <laughs> right? Miss Liz has everybody on tea time. Uh, so, Gary, let's get started with you. Who was Gary as a little boy, and who's Gary now? Ah, I was uh, one of seven. I was the second, actually, of seven siblings. I have an older sister. And um, started in a one-room school, the first through fourth grade. And, and uh, in fact, my latest book, you were learning from one room school is uh, one of the things we'll visit with uh, about tonight because I, I basically put them together memories of, of being in the first through fourth grade and uh, some of the funny things and some of the stupid things they did as a little kid. And who are you now, Gary, as a grown man? Well, I'm a retired 12 years. I've had a very good life. Um, I don't know how many countries I've been in. My wife and I retired 12 years ago and were able to travel. We actually sold our house. Uh, we had an RV for a couple of summers. We did the east and the west coast of the U.S. Our son lived in Australia. He's a doctor in Australia. So we uh, went over there and spent a couple of winters, uh, which is their summer, of course, and uh, came back and, and uh, traveled the U.S. We have an orphan girl in Uganda that we helped sponsor her school. And so we went over and, and seen her and and uh, just have been, uh, we spent a lot of time in Mexico. We like wintering down there. But uh, just a South Dakota farm kid that has, has been a, uh, had a very fortunate life. <laughs> so, Gary, let's talk about your book. Let's get right into your book because I found out that there's lots of humor in there. Uh, 
There's also, let me, let me, what did I write down here? There's some bullying in there, jealousy, discipline, heartbreak. There's a lot going on in that book. Uh, there, there is. I, I have it up here. Here we're learning in a one-room school. And uh, first, I want to compliment my sketch artist that uh, she was from South Carolina. I, I had met her on a, um, a presentation, and I, I, I liked her simple um, feeling sketches. And so I asked her after I'd finished, uh, by the way, uh, humor learning in a one-room school is a 1400 line, 350 stanza rhyming poem. So it's uh, not more than 18 words per, per a four line stanza. So it's a very simple poem written uh, that uh, you know, a fourth grader could, could read, but it's entertaining that uh, senior citizens, especially if they've gone to smaller, even one-room schools, uh, our daughter just uh, finished reading it and called me this afternoon and was cracking up at some of the things that she's her daughter. And they, you know, it was just surprised her. Uh, some of the, the things, the pranks that happened and things like that in, in school that even though she had gone to a small school, she hadn't realized that some of the things that a different generation experienced that she didn't. Well, it, it, when it's a smaller school, there's more of a... More fun, I find. I, I come from a small community, too, and we had, like, I think 15 kids in one classroom, you know, and then as it got, the years passed, like, I think that we had 30 in the classroom. Like, we didn't have very big classrooms. Well, that was actually uh, uh, pretty big because I was the only Oh, student, really? <laughs> I was the only student in my, uh, the first four years. Uh, oh, first, wow. third and fourth grade. I was the only first, second, third, and fourth grader, and... Uh, the most we had, I think, was 13 in eight grades. Uh, and, you know, that was uh, only because my younger brother and three other kids his age started the first grade when I was in the fourth. So we, we had a huge first grade class. Wow. So how was that for you, being the only student? Well, I didn't know if I was learning fast or slow. slow. I, uh, at some point, I realized I was actually learning something because uh, we were, like my, my parents were uh, very poor and we, we lived in one, two, three, four, four room, uh, basically a tar paper house, some people call it a shack, but uh, and my mom babysit uh, um, two kids from uh, the teacher that uh, served the school, one room school just down the road from us. And so uh, we just learned to play with each other and, and uh, you know, didn't have books, so I didn't. I didn't know the ABCs when I went to school. In fact, I barely. I don't think I could recite them. By the time I changed schools, we my grandma died, and we had to move oh, about 120 miles to to our grandpa's farm to help him. When I was halfway through the first grade, and uh, my second teacher, I I started learning numbers better and uh, ABCs and things like that better. But I think I remember so much because I couldn't read. I, I, we didn't have books at home or anything like that, uh, just a few toys. Uh, and so I think my mind developed a little bit different in that I, I remember things, uh, um, uh, minute details of, of stories. And that's really what's in the book. So your book is based on a poem? It is. The, the book is a poem actually the, fir the first half of it is is a poem it's 350 stanzas uh, four line stanzas rhyming and in that i tell stories of basically before i was in the first grade through the fourth grade and so uh, these stories involve everything like um well I, let me back up just a little bit the other half of the book i should explain is explanations of the first half because oh well that's pretty different eh? my sketch artist and she she basically i sent her the poem and she basically drew uh sketches based on that particular stanza and so oh. there's just fun fun I, I put a lot of uh like my uh little pictures when i was a kid and and things like that in there but my sketch artist just went on and on and found lots of different things to to sketch on and she said but gary when she finishes, she goes, you really need a glossary or commentary because the students now use smart boards or whiteboards. They have no idea what a blackboard is. 
I mean, it's just the opposite of what they're teaching. Yeah. Right? Uh, we had a ceramic crock for water in school. The ceramic crock, what, you know, what is that? Uh, outhouses, we didn't have running water, telephone in school or anything like that. And so I explained not only the things in school, but I was a farm kid, which you know, went back and forth to the school and we had farm chores and things like that. So I needed to explain some of the things I did when I was in first through fourth grade that had nothing to do with school, but I was part of the poem. Well, I think I think it also brings back the history, right? People, I think the children reading that today would uh, appreciate what they have in, in a classroom. Well, this this book is less than a month old, uh, actually about three weeks old. And um, locally, I attend the farmers market. I'm the only, we'll call it, artist at the farmers market. Uh, the rest, the other forty booths or whatever, uh, sell food and frozen goods, canned goods, things like that, uh, fresh vegetables. But you know. I think a lot of people come to my booth because you can only talk so long about broccoli. You know, it's just, it, they just they just migrate to my booth and so I get to visit with them. Well, it so happened that this that this last Saturday was the second time I had my book at the market and um, three ladies come by, you know, chatted and they go, oh, this is a nice visit. And, and I found out that they were a second, third and fourth grade teachers. They were oh. related, they just, uh, worked at the same school and were friends and Saturday morning farmer's market was one of their outings. And so uh, they said, oh, you know what? Uh, I, I told them a little bit about this book and they said, well, how about uh, we buy one and we'll just share it in, in school. Well, before they left, but they not only bought two books so they could uh, uh, read it to their class. That was the plan. Read it to their classes. And then they said, OK, we'll coordinate a plan. And so on the same day, uh, we'll have you come in after we've read the poem to the kids. We'll have you come in and surprise the kids as a local author of this book. And so I go, ah, that sounds like fun. See, you just never know what happens, right? No. You Brock, have to what put yourself does, out there. right? <laughs> you put yourself out there to, I don't know, hundreds of people. And so uh, both volunteering in your in your interviews and things like that. And I think it's just it's it's so good to be visiting with somebody like you that does put themselves out there. Yeah. And you just never know what you get when you go for broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You, 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 you don't know, that's for sure. You might end up with Brussels sprouts because you didn't know the difference. So. Right. So how long did it take you to write the book, Gary? Ah, uh, uh, besides being an author, by the way, this is my 10th book. I, I put on there seven. Uh, one I have unpublished, another one, this one just came out, another one is uh, uh, is strictly a poem book. Uh, so I, I do write poetry. So to answer your question specifically, this 350 stanzas was, and it was actually more, was written in two settings because I just started rolling and it was actually two different poems. One was just the first grade in stories and the other one was second, third, and fourth. And I decided to tie them together, which meant I had to throw out some stanzas and, and put some transitional stanzas in there, but all with the same, basically same format. The, I, you know, lines average 3.3 words. And so it's very short. It's just simple little stories, like as if I was a first, second, third or fourth grader telling these stories. I like that, you know, because it, it can, it's good for seniors as well, especially yes. seniors that have dementia, right? And it is, it is. So it, it it will bring back memories to them. Um, you know, our, our, like I said, our daughter uh, read it just uh, the first time today. It's a it's a very quick read, and part of the reason I wrote it with fairly large, uh, for example, I have um, at most I think it's four or five, five stanzas per page. And so it's fairly large print. I don't know if you Oh, can that's see good. It. Yeah. Large print because uh, if you're trying to write for a, uh, a young audience, they like larger letters. I did, I know. Uh, and uh, I have uh, my wife's aunt, we, we went and visited her and she gets books every week from the library. And she can no longer, I said, you know, I got a hard hardcover. I'll just mail you a hardcover of one of my books. And she goes, oh, Gary, I, 
I can't hold hardcover books anymore. And of course, she's a little bit uh, harder to see, so she likes large print. And so she likes paperback, large print. And so um, before I'd actually formatted this book, I kept that in mind and basically designed it so that not only the young kids, but also uh, seniors like her can sit in her armchair and just have a good, funny, humorous, quick read. You know, and paper, we, we never really talked about this. Paperback is easier to hold, right, than the hard books. Well, if you think of elderly ladies, uh, and you take a book that's a pound and a half or two pounds, you know, they, they love reading. They have sight and intellect to, to read, but they can't be physically overwhelmed by holding a book up here like this. It, and so um, I hadn't thought of it until she brought it up. Yeah. And the large print is easy too. It, I find when the print is too small, I get overwhelmed. I'm just like, oh, I got to read all this. <laughs> yes. The other thing that um, I especially, probably the most prevalent in this book is that uh, the, the stanzas are short. The lines are short. There's lots of white space. And so it's filled in with, with photos and sketches. Uh, you know, personal photos that uh, tied in uh, with uh, with that particular story. So it's 350 stanzas, but there's some some stanzas are, you know, maybe a story within uh, eight lines or, uh, you know, one or two stanzas. And then other ones might go on three or five or, or 10 stanzas at the most to tell a, tell a story or an incident. So in this book, Gary, you have some bullying going on, some jealousy, some discipline, some heartbreak. So what what, what grades were was all that happening in grade one, grade two, three, four? The, 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 the whole series, because I, I, use, I use different stories from different uh, incidents. Uh, for example, uh, the, the bullying when I was in the first grade, I was the only kid in my class, I go to school and um, it was, uh, there was what, five older boys and, uh, the oldest next to me was in the third grade, but they, during recess would go out and walk around the sloughs and the, the fields, hayland, and you're looking for tracking wildlife and stuff like that. Uh, and they wouldn't invite me along because I was just a little stupid little kid. And so to, in today's terms, that would be considered bullying. Yeah. Uh, Within a month and a half or so by pheasant season, which would have been October, um, middle of October of 59, uh, they invited me along. So I get to drop around in the fields and check for pheasant tracks and rabbit tracks and, you know, coon and fox and all that kind of thing. And so I was part of the group by two months later. All right. Um, so that's that's a bullying story. There's there's another one that I send a, a review to my sister before i put this out she's a year older than i am 11 months older actually and uh she called me as soon as she finished reading and she goes gary i am so sad i mean i i feel bad that i never told you uh about that um uh, I, I never told you about the tv in the attic of the one room school and i go well i i wrote it it was funny i didn't figure it out until i was in the second grade but the story goes that all the kids in school, we couldn't go out because it was blizzarding. So we couldn't go outside and the kids ganged up together without my knowledge and would climb up the, the tiny little room that basically held desks where they used for storage. And these, the boys had stacked desks on top of desk and climb up there and lifted the attic hole and would look in the attic hole and say, oh yeah, this is on TV. And, you know, and the other kids, oh, can I see? And so they would come down, the next one would be helped up and and they would never let me go up because I was just a stupid little kid. And so my sister was a part of the group. She was in the second grade. She was a part of the group, but always kept the secret because they said, don't you tell Gary. And so my <laughs> sister would not tell, you know. And so uh, she was bullied into not telling me. And finally, we went to a different school. And sometime during the second grade, I figured out there was no school, there was no TV there. Wow. 
Let's talk about TVs back in the day because yeah. I remember where we had to put the SOS pads for the rabbit ears at Grandma and Grandpa's Ooh. house, right? Yeah. You only had the three channels. If you wanted to change the channel, you had to get up and change it. There was no remote controls back then. So, boy, you you were lived in a populated area when you had three uh, three different stations. We we had one at first and eventually got uh, a couple of them. But again, rural area. We were we got our first TV in. Uh, uh, for Christmas, 1956. And how I remember is, is basically, I was only three years old, but uh, my, my mother would tell this story that she was, uh, um, she graduated high school at 19 because she had to quit during the war to, to uh, help on the farm and stuff. And then she went to a 10 week uh, teacher's training course. And so she taught for one year for, as a 19 year old to a 20 year old. She was a teacher in 1950. They got married in, in 51. My sister was born in 52. I was born in 53. My brother, 54, another brother, 55, uh, TV, 56, another brother, 57. So from 1950 to 57, I can just remember 56 was the TV year. <laughs> Well, and those are the good old days. Like my grandpa used to always say, like uh, when we got the TV, right? If you didn't like channel one, you could go to channel two. If you didn't like channel two, you go to channel three. And if you didn't like channel three, you could go to bed. <laughs> That's me. Hey, there. You had a good grandpa. Uh, it, that reminds me less of the, the story of my uh, brother. My youngest brother is quite a bit younger than, than I am. He was born in 66. Um, and, and he has two boys, and so when the boys were uh, were young, um, they, they were watching TV, and and my brother picks up the remote, and he goes, "Look at me looking at." When I was your age, I had to walk over to the TV and turn channels. <laughs> <laughs> my grandpa had us on rotate. <laughs> okay, you turned it the last time. Okay, your turn. No, your turn. Oh, that was like a chore. All right. <laughs> Yeah, and it was either Will of Fortune that we watched or it was hockey. Uh, and it was always fun to watch hockey with Grandma and Grandpa because they had two opposite teams. So you knew when oh. their teams were playing each other, it got pretty feisty in the house. It, yes, it was like yes. Grandma's side of the house, living room or Grandpa's side, and you, you didn't argue with him. <laughs> now, did just, they play hockey or just like to watch hockey? Just watch hockey. My grandma okay. was Boston Bruins and my grandpa was Montreal Canadiens. Uh, sure. So it got pretty feisty sometimes in the house. Oh yeah, that's hey, that's pretty neat, pretty neat. And you didn't interrupt the, no. the game. <laughs> and if they scored, well, if you were sitting on the other side, you better not be cheering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah, that's neat. That's neat. It's, it's it, isn't it fun to to think back and uh, you know I. I you didn't say what age you were, but but uh, preschool or even in school, younger grades in school, you can think back with humor. It's not like you remember the bad times. It was the funny things. You remember the grandpa and grandma stories. It's just, yeah. it's fun. And it's fun to write about those things. And I think we need more stories like that, like yours, Gary, out there. You know, bring back some history. I love history. I could talk about history all day. Everybody knows Miss Liz likes to talk about the old stuff. Uh, I collect teapots, right? And then they're vintage and the stories behind who made those teacups and all of that stuff. So And how they got to where they got and how they ended up in your possession. You, you'd mentioned uh, yeah. at, at some point uh, that you do volunteer work and things like that. And that people just know you as Miss, uh, Miss Liz's tea time. And so they, they have a set of uh, tea glasses, teacups, whatever that they certainly don't want to see destroyed or just take to a local uh, you know, flea market or, or a goodwill store. And instead they think of you, which, which to me, that is, that brought life, meaning the character, your character out to, to me. And it does to others, I'm sure. So Gary, tell me a few of your childhood stories in this classroom because you had some jealousy going on. So who were you jealous of? Um, oh, geez. Um, you know, I think one of I just picked up, I, I made a little note of uh, this today, just before I went in there, just so that you could um, uh, read this because uh, like a heartbreak story was a girl, I uh, was in third grade and she died in my class. And I was jealous of the kids that uh, when we were playing Fox and Goose, 
I was, you know, I was the slowest one and I could never catch them, you know, so I was always jealous that they could, they could uh, do more or, uh, you know, one, one kid, I, I, I'd say, uh, uh, um, told a story about how we were, were swinging on the swing and, and uh, one of the kids said that he made a loop completely around. Well, I was jealous of that, but at the same time, was he telling the truth or was he just, you know, pulling my leg? And so maybe, maybe I should just uh, read a, a few uh, sentences. Um, there are a few stanzas, if that would be okay. Oh, absolutely. Uh, teacher's finger curled around tiny chalk. Her nail screeched, stopped our talk. Frost on windows, magical design. When will noon come? It's about time. Four grade lessons done by noon. One more session, get to play soon. Cold room won't spoil my sandwich meat nor wormy crab apple as my treat. Eight wormy crab apples every day. Apples, apples about a ton. Always one away from a good one. Apples kept the doctor away no matter how I faked. Ate from baby food jar, mashed, sauced, and baked. So th these are the, the, the kinds of uh, uh, stories and rhyme that I that I put together. Um, let me go to, let's see, how about uh, page 30. Um, okay, here's one about the blackboard. On blackboard, I drew white. Colored chalk for those who write. I use pencil. Others use pens. Teacher thought I'd make a mess. But I got to sharpen pencils every day. That was my plan for in-school play. Every crank, no, every crank turn sharpened pencil tip. I had to learn when to quit. Cranking cravings, wanted to do more. Dump pencil shavings on the floor. My standard pencil was a number two. B for art. Teacher, not you. I was good. I wasn't good keeping in lines, but did what I could in set time. And just, you know, uh, things like that. So. I like the flow of it, Gary. It's really playful. But that's the goal. That's the goal. So again, whether you're, you know, 90 years old and sitting in your rocking chair or, or you're, uh, I had a second grader uh, uh, um, and I didn't know him because he was, a, he was a pretty big kid. His parents uh, came to the farmer's market on Saturday and I, I was, they looked at this book and some of my other books and, and they picked it up and, and the, the son looked at the back of the book and he was reading and he was reading quite slow. You know, he was like, pretty big kid. So I was guessing, you know, fourth, fifth grade. And uh, it seems like a really sharp kid. And uh, the, the mom says, Oh, should we get this for you? He goes, Oh, I'd rather read the one destination North Pole one, uh, mom. And I go, what, what age are you? What grade are you in? Second, and I go, geez, that's pretty good. Then you can read the back of my book. And so he was big second grader. And so uh, the folks not only bought Destination North Pole, because I have a YouTube video uh, that my grand nephew did of all my wife's and, and my uh, bike trip up there with all the animals and, you know, the moose, the bear and, and all that kind of thing in it. And so I thought, wow, this is this will really be encouraging for the kids, even if you can't read the book, you'll at least see the video and want to uh, read or at least hear some of the some of the stories. But this I am convinced that that particular second grader with good parenting and obviously good parenting and obviously good teachers would be able to read this, read my uh, one room school book. Let's talk about the North Pole because I, when I seen that, I was like, Oh, I got somebody else that went to the North Pole. I had Santa Claus earlier this year. Now I have somebody who rode a bike to the North Pole and some of the animals and the video is really amazing. I watched the video on YouTube. So everybody go and check that out on the YouTube channel. Uh, really, truly amazing, uh, Gary, what you've done. But what got you to ride a bike to the North Pole? Well, let me let me just uh, pull out a couple here. Where is it at? Uh, let me grab these. Uh, I had written written two books: uh, "Learning as an Influence of the 21st Century" and "Culture and Mysterious Agent uh, Relating to Ancient Culture and Mysterious Agent Changing It." They're they're uh, mind bending books, meaning that they were. In, in my sense, they were fun to write because I tried to figure out why culture changes so fast uh, in the last half of the 20th century and the 21st, where historically, you like history, I like history, historically, cultures and societies change very slow. 
But as we traveled around the world, we've seen that cultures change fast. Well, the same thing happened. People would say, yeah, kids, you know, the way they learn now is completely different the way I learned. You know, I would go out with my aunt and uncle or, or my grandma and, you know, my dad, and we would have to do this and this and this. And, and so I go, okay. So I wrote the book relating to ancient learning, how people used to learn compared to how they learn now. So anyway, my mind was tired after writing, you know, two books over 700 pages. And I asked my wife, I, I finished the book to her in high school. Mm -hmm. And I asked my wife, I said, uh, Patricia, you want to, I want, always wanted to do a long bicycle ride. And we'd, we'd done a few, you know, overnight rides. And uh, I asked her to go along and she says, no, I'll drive. And I go, well, I'm thinking about biking up to our niece and nephew's place in North Pole, Alaska. It's up by Fairbanks. And so my mind was tired, but I go, wow, I'm, you know, I'm retired, 65 years old. It's, uh, you know, I, I just celebrated my 65th birthday. And I go, well, let's well, uh, well, fly home. And within a week, I was on my 10-year-old bicycle, uh, bags loaded. My wife came back a couple days later, and she stayed back for our Memorial Day uh, at the end of the month end of May because uh, she had lost her older brother. And so I left on May 20th thinking it would take me two months to bike from Pierce, South Dakota to uh, North Pole, Alaska. It's 3,000 miles or uh, just shy of 5,000 kilometers. And so I, I had no idea if I was going to make it or not. And, and so within a week, I started pedaling. But before I left, I was, it was just me. I wasn't going to tell anybody, uh, you know, other than my wife and kids that I was doing it because I had no idea, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's quite a challenge you know, for any age. And, but friends found out and other family and they said, Gary, you got to do a blog, put a blog on your, on your website and just do a blog. And after I started going, you know, I was doing it every day from my iPhone because that's all I carried. And uh, I would tell, you know, uh, two, three, four uh, paragraphs, of what happened that day on the blog. And then I realized, you know what? I think all they wanted to know is where I was going to get killed or where I ended my ride because there's no way he's going to go 3,000 miles up to northern Alaska. So how long did it take you to get there? 40 days. I thought it would take me two months, but uh, uh, I, averaged, I, I left on May 20th. The, and the reason was the longest day of the year is June 20th. Okay, uh, summer solstice. So if I'm in um, northern Canada, say the Yukon, in June, uh, it's light out at midnight. And since we weren't planning on camping, I was going to bike until my wife found a clean bed. And that's what we did. We never camped once, never slept on the car. I biked until she found a place where there was a, 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 a motel, which was rare up there, uh, work camps, um, uh, bed and breakfast, Airbnbs, you know, just whatever she could find. And so uh, that's the reason I I made more miles than, than I had anticipated. I got there June 30th, averaging 75 miles a day for uh, 40 days. That's quite a, quite a distance for a bike ride. It is. You know, my, my longest is actually in Saskatchewan. And by the way, that's why I call it 5,000 kilometers by bicycle, because my uh, most of my ride, of course, was in Canada. I went through uh, the Dakotas up to uh, Saskatchewan and then uh, North Regina. I started heading northwest into Alberta. I didn't want to go through Calgary, Alberta, or Calgary or uh, Edmonton. And so I went between the two with Tasquin and, and I headed up into uh, the Yukon, of course, uh, corner of British Columbia. And then uh, you know, a good share of the time, uh, 15, 20% of the time was in, in the Yukon, which is <laughs> not many towns and certainly uh, a distance between uh, location. But my longest ride actually was fully loaded before my wife caught up with me was uh, uh, 166 miles. So that would be like 267 kilometers or something like that oh. in one day. And then my shortest happened to be in the Yukon. It was only like 12 or 15 miles, say 20, 20 25 kilometers, something like that. And the reason was my wife found a uh, lodging, two, play, two little towns close together. So it was kind of like a break day. I just had to do uh, that. <laughs> well, today is going to be easy day. Yeah, an easy day. You know, <laughs> fill the car with gas, get some supplies, whatever. <laughs> so have you ever had anybody reach out to you, Gary, and say, have you met Santa Claus in person at the North Pole? 
they asked because I'd be surprisingly how many people we live uh, in a town with a, an Air Force base right outside, right outside of town. And a lot of people that have come to my farmer's market booth and have bought my books have been to the North Pole, the town of North Pole, because they lived in Fairbanks or near Fairbanks or North Pole was between their base and Fairbanks. And so some of them actually stayed as married couples uh, in North Pole. So had I ever, yes, they have, but it's been people that two things. One, yeah, sure, you've been to the North Pole. Like, you can't bike there, it's all ice. And I go, well, not that North Pole. It became, uh, when I decided to name the book, I, I had different names for the for the book, and this is obviously my working copy, but uh, Destination North Pole. I go, well, my destination was North Pole, Alaska. So, okay, it's kind of like a play on words, and you always want a hook yeah. in your book, especially in your title. So that was kind of my hook to get people to pick up the book. Yeah. Well, and you always have that person that sees a cover and says, does the North Pole really exist? You know, because there's some people out there that don't even think North Pole exists. And well, it does, right? The, the surprising thing, I think, to a lot of people, one, is there's a town of North Pole. Uh, and number two, there's two North Poles. One is in Colorado, west of Colorado Springs, and the other one is in Alaska, that I know of the towns. The and other, there might be another one out there. There, there know, sure right? could be. I'm not an expert at <laughs> North Pole towns. You know? uh, that uh, Santa Claus, he's all over. He's got a lot of North Pole. Right? You're going to have to have a Santa Claus. I mean, this guy knows <laughs> everything. Um, and so the other thing, they go, yeah, North Pole, like, um, they don't know North Pole moves. And I, I yeah. go, yeah, it's moved like a thousand miles since I was born. So, yeah, it, it keeps shuffling around. Right. Well, we keep all shifting around, like with all oh, yeah. the movement and all the slides and everything out there. Like, you just never know where you're gonna land. The older you get, the the more stuff shifts around. I'll just put that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just start to shift when you get older. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to some place I hadn't I hadn't planned on going, but uh, it doesn't matter where wherever you uh, uh, wherever you journey, whether it's personal or physically, it's uh, or mentally. It's 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 always fun to explore it's something new. Yeah. So Gary, let's get into your two. You gave me three amazing words. So you gave me rural research and resources. Why'd you give me three R's? I, I I'm a rural kid. I made my living in agriculture, and I you know went to one room schools. It, it, it was it was just it was rural. And the other thing I think that. Uh, I, I put research in there because I always had a desire to try to figure things out. And um, I, I ended up uh, researching for internationally researching for 15 years with the University of Uladog in Bursa, Turkey. We, I, I had, uh, that's, that's a whole other story. And so I did international research uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, you see a millet book. Let's see, it's over here, uh, a millet book that uh, I had written in 1990. It's, it's how to produce this ancient grain of millet, uh, which now is considered a health food, although a lot of people know it as birdseed. But it's a very, very healthy grain, uh, cook it like rice. Well, anyway, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and abandoned all state farms in Mongolia. And uh, a Swiss aid organization thereafter uh, went in to help the the people of Mongolia, because there's only 3% of the whole country is farmland. And the Soviet farms had been set up in the valleys where they irrigated, but they had no fuel, they had no equipment, they couldn't keep the irrigating running. And so the, the people were really uh, hungry. And what they had done is, uh, because they had gone through every type, pretty much every type of government in the 20th century, for example, Mongolia ended a 300-year dynasty at the beginning of the 20th century, around 1910, something like that. They were a, a, a socialism for, under socialism for a while. They were under Buddhist theocracy, uh, Tibetan theocracy. They were under uh, Chinese control for a while. They uh, were under Soviet uh, socialism, then communism, and by 1992, democracy and had a stock market. So the point is that Mongolians could not rely on government for anything. They had to eat, they had to have clothing, and it was up to them and their family to do it. 
and they went back to eating what they've always eaten for thousands of years, 10,000 or more years. Millet, because it's very, very drought tolerant, the tolerant and the, the drought, most drought tolerant grain, and would grow on high elevations. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, drank camel's milk and uh, used hides. That was in tea. They made tea out of camel's milk and, and sometimes more. So the point is the Swiss aid organization went over to help them, flew to the U.S. to try to learn something about raising this grain. The guy ran across my book in the University of Minnesota. A library called me, and unfortunately, we couldn't meet because of a winter storm. But I ended up sending that book and was, in effect, a, uh, I'm an agronomist, so I was a consultant, basically, for the University of Mongolia. As, and I sent varieties of millet that I thought would work in Mongolia uh, over there. And we had a, a student doing her master's degree uh, do research. And so that was never published publicly, but it was good data. So about two, three years ago, I summarized it into a research paper of, of what Mongolians went through for government, as well as the 20th century history of food production. So I, I go a long story, but I like research. And so from research, I like to help people. And then the other, uh, the other R was uh, resources. And uh, I have resources that in this case, Mongolians didn't have. I knew varieties that I thought were, well, that I knew were developed in the high plains of Nebraska and worked in the uh, Northeast Colorado. And so uh, higher elevations, similar to the elevations in Mongolia. And then when I looked at the the geography, I go, yeah, and millet, because it's photosensitive, will move north. In fact, there's a millet, Alberta, by the way, a town, millet, Alberta. And so I knew it would move to that latitude. And so it turns out that the three varieties that I sent were the three highest varieties in the trials. And they had two varieties from Mongolia and one from uh, Russia, the Siberia, uh, that they, they they used. And so the resources, I again, have resources that if I can help somebody out, I try to do it. I think research is really deeply important. In today's world, I, I find that we're not doing enough research, right? We're just giving them, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. I, I strongly encourage people to research and get involved and get educated, right? Yep, absolutely. Excuse me. Um, for example, I had a, an opportunity to uh, go to Turkey on a month-long tour with Rotary International, oh. and uh, I was the, the farm guy. We had a, a, a doctor and a, a, a attorney and an accountant and, and five of us, and so we were touring Turkey, and I was always going to the agricultural businesses, and one day uh, the nursing, uh, 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 she was a nurse practitioner, uh, she had lined up a tour of the university and they had a new nursing program there and it was the newest agricultural college in uh, uh, Turkey. And so we were taken there and I was of course going with the, the agricultural uh, agronomy group. And I had done some research on um, minimum tillage and conservation, soil and water conservation. And I was asked to uh, uh, speak that afternoon at uh, for a master's degree class on conservation because Turkey has a terrible erosion problem. And so uh, that started a 15 year research project with uh, University of Uladog in Bursa, Turkey. And so again, like Mongolia, in the late 90s, I sent uh, uh, millet varieties over to Turkey and they did the research over three, uh, three to four years and I could write English uh, uh, better than they, and international journals are published in English. And so um, we would do the research, they would do the research, I would help summarize it and put it into a research paper. And we have it in a number of uh, journals around the world. And uh, then they started other projects with peas and other crops, which I consulted with them. And then I worked on some forage soybeans, uh, you know, before the 19... 30s, all the soybeans in the U.S. were basically raised for forage. And so I started a, a forage soybean research project with uh, Mongolia also. So uh, just yeah, it's just a way of helping people out. So Gary, I, I, I did some homework on you and I found that you have six patents out there. Mm -hmm. 
so, so what did you happen because I, I i looked at the images and i was like like is this a machine they, they... well okay uh the last 10 years of my career uh, uh, i'll just back up soybean seed in the us and canada were primarily handled almost exclusively handled in paper bags when new varieties come out they were put in 50 pound paper bags and um, the, the bags would go to waste. If the farmers, they would blow away, farmers would have to burn them. Uh, they come on a wooden pallet. And so in uh, 1997, uh, me and, and uh, two farmers and uh, our soybean product manager and a, and a guy that I was working with, uh, we came up with this idea of handling it in bulk, but it had to be identity preserved. Long story short, uh, I thought it would take me 10 years to develop this project across the U.S. and Canada, and uh, uh, I, I was, yeah, I, I did. And so what I did developed was uh, the equipment, meaning I, I talked to our equipment people what they needed to keep the quality of soybean from getting damaged, the seed getting damaged, what they required for identity preserved, uh, different varieties. And uh, we developed this system, and then I would inspect equipment in the U.S. and Canada that met our standards. And then our competitors picked it up, and and so uh, I, I developed that in the U.S. and Canada, and finished up in my last project was uh, introducing it to Argentina. Well, in the meantime, I seen a need for uh, delivery systems uh, closer to the farmers, and and so I did a uh, design patent on a piece of equipment that would identity preserve the seed and uh, uh, deliver it to farmers uh, that way without damage. And so there's some, uh, that involved some engineering. So four other patents involved the engineering of how to make that work and the uh, electronics of it to identity uh, preserved by individual. And then uh, since I already were work was working with patent attorneys and, and uh, you know, doing my job, uh, for years, I had thought of what a waste that all grain has to be dried down, especially corn, has to be dried down and then rehydrated to, to use for food or, or especially ethanol, 40% of the U.S. corn going to ethanol. I go, that's that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. There's, and so I, I developed a, a patent on how to take standing corn without adding additional water uh, just adding some enzymes, yeast, and some other things, uh, uh, take a standing field of corn and in 24 to 72 hours, convert it into a biofuel, water, and solids. I could separate it. And so that that was my last patent. It was actually finally issued two years after I retired because patents take a long, long time to develop. But just to finish up this project, that uh, development of that identity preserved system saves today in the U.S. and Canada about 100 million paper bags per year. Wow. Per year. That's how big an influence just one, you know, but not, I can't say I'm just me because I, I worked with, a whole, I had 300 people in the U.S. that I worked with to develop, uh, to get this spread out, you know, and I was the person that would go around and, and help figure out financing and, you know, the, the type of equipment that would work for them. But uh, that's the impact that a project can make when when you're using paper bags, you think nothing of it because that's what you want. But, you know, I encourage people to use their imagination to yeah. come up with other things, whether it's patentable or not, is one thing. There's a lot of people get confused between patents and inventions. I have inventions that are not patented and I have patents that aren't implemented as people would call uh, invention, meaning only parts of it have been implemented. And so, um, for example, when I went to um, Destination North Pole, I'll just give an example. Went to North Pole. I, uh, on long dis distance bicycle rides before that, uh, I always got sore wrists, you know, 25, 30, 30 miles, so I, my wrists would get sore. And so I knew that every day I would be fighting just my sore, sore wrists. And so the day before I left, it was a Saturday. I went down to the local hardware store 
and uh, the bike stores had sold me palm pads, uh, you know, gloves with palm pads and little pads on the end of my handlebars and tilt handlebar and stuff like that. So I went to the local hardware store, took my old bike stand, found a piece of PVC, went to the bike store, got some uh, padded tape, wrapped it up, uh, mounted it on my bicycle and went 3,000 miles, 5,000 kilometers, and never once, not one day, did I have a sore wrist. So uh, that's an invention, all right? And so I, I go, I'm, you know, I'm 65 years old. I don't want to go hassle with patent attorneys and things like that. So I said, okay, I will put it in the book. I will write it in the book. And I made a YouTube video on wrist support bar. So once it's out in the public, nobody else can patent it. And anybody can make it freely for like 30 bucks. Wow. See, and, and, and that's the difference, right? Is because I always wanted to know the difference between an invention and a patent. And you, and you just shared it with us on how it works. I, I tried to simplify it because it, it is confusing. It can be confusing. Well, a patent and a trademark is two different things as well, right, Gary? Yes. Now, I, I don't know. See, one of my patents is actually in Canada. Um, I get a Canadian patent, but they're, they're international patents. It just happened to be um, uh, approved through the Canadian Patent Office and then five of them in the U.S. But um, in the U.S., the Patent and Trademark Office is the same government organization. They're just different okay. divisions. And I developed this handling system. I developed, it's called True Bolt, T-R-U, capital B-U-L-K. Uh, uh, Bolt was, a, was a, a company trademark system. And then you basically other competitors use the same equipment, but they could not use our trademark name. So, uh, for example, McDonald's hamburger, you can't, you know, have a, a yellow sign up there with the arches and sell McDonald's, McDonald's hamburger because they have a trademark. It's not a patent. It's a trademark on that name, that design, that design of the M. Well, we did the same thing with our true ball uh, handling system. Uh -uh. Thanks for getting that information out there because uh, I know a lot of my listeners and uh, they have questions and they, they want to know, right? And I, Miss Liz always gets those questions out for you guys because I know that you're a little a little on the shy side sometimes and you're like, Miss Liz, are you going to catch that? Are you going to get that out there for us? And uh, of course I will. You, uh, you have an amazing audience and a very, very diverse audience. And so a lot of these, uh, you know, what I just commented on the last few minutes, uh, maybe it went on too long, I apologize but it would not be interesting to some, but I think others might find it very intriguing and help them develop their idea. Well, and, and it's to get the awareness out there and get the right information out there because you know, there's so much false information out in the world today that we need to get the proper information out there. <laughs> very good. Thank you for doing that. Well, Gary, you gave me the word interested when I asked you to describe yourself as an individual. Why that word interested? I'm I'm interested in, as you probably can tell I'm interested in a lot of things I I, I made my living in agriculture uh, in grains but we were on a cattle farm I made I bought my first three cars raising pigs I mean I, I just my my whole life has been uh, an interesting journey and uh, I, it's it's probably a word that's just stuck with me there's always something else more interesting I got to figure out. So, Gary, what was your first car that you bought yourself? A 59 Pontiac. Oh, nice car. Yeah, I miss this well, car. It was a 400, <laughs> it was a 400 cubic inch, uh, big old green car. It was all like oh, a Green on top of it. Oh, awesome. It cost me my first car was a peacock green. Uh, peacock I had green. A, well, I had a Cadillac. Peacock. Well, uh, it was kind of like your Cadillac. It was probably like my 59 Pontiac, but... That car was in its day, and of course, this was in the it was ten years old when I bought it. But uh, back then, it was an old car. Um, it, it had chrome; everything was chrome inside. All the gauges were chrome across the. the you know, it had it, it didn't have chrome across the, the top. Now you would have to have padding up there because it was like a killer if you ever hit your head on it. But it was to me, it was an amazing old '59 Pontiac with a bunch of chrome. You know, the cars back then, they were built solid, like.
<laughs> I I really up. love old cars. Like if you want to make Miss Liz happy, take me to a car show. I'll, I'll be like, oh yes, <laughs> that's like taking me out for ice cream. Like I uh, I I when I'm driving, I'm in the passenger side now because I don't drive anymore. But when I see an old car, I'm just like, oh, that is so nice. Yeah. So I went from a '59 Pontiac to a '61 uh, uh, Bel Air, uh, '60 Bel Air, I think it was, and a '61. Uh, Chevy Impala. So that was my first uh, three cars as a teenager. Oh wow! Nice cars, nice picks. And they would they would still be beauties today had I had them. Oh my goodness! Yeah, they would. You could always bring them back. <laughs> I'd have to I'd have to find them. the The '59 Pontiac is a rare, rare car because uh, one, it had a, a big motor. Number two, it's too large to store. A lot of restorers like smaller cars. And it had a, a default with the, the, the rear end. Um, they had trouble holding the body basically because it was so big, it holding the body to the, the differential and the, the uh, rear axle. And so they, they basically got crushed. Uh, the That's other, wow. you mentioned green cars. Uh, I, I, after that, I, um, I, I bought a 71 Chevy Vega with not the hatchback, almost all of them were hatchback. They were very few with actual trunk. So back window in a trunk. And so I had one of those. I have never, ever seen one since. It's just oh, wow. it's like one of those cars that got destroyed and they are rare, rare. Yeah, my car was really rare. My godfather gave it to me when I first got my license. And he's like, this is my gift to you. And it was a peacock green Cadillac. And I was like, wow. And it had all like the wood cravings and all oh, like it. They don't yeah, make that year? anymore. Now it's what everything's was plastic. That? And <laughs> do you remember what year the model was? I'm not sure what the year was. I, I'd have to. I'd have to ask my because I'm, I'm just my mind is running trying to imagine this wood paneling on. Yeah. Oh yeah, Pretty it cool. had nice wood paneling inside, and the color was a, a nice peacock green, like the feather, the peacock. <laughs> oh, it was gorgeous. Yeah. Everybody, everybody thought I was and. He just gave it to me just as as a gift to me, and I, I'll always remember that. And all of the dashboard didn't work, so I had to learn how to drive blind. So nothing worked. He's so like, he, speed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's like, feel the gas, girl. And I had a heavy foot back then, so yeah. So it was pretty exciting. But that's how I learned how to drive was with my Peacock Cadillac. So uh, now that had a stick shift on the column, right? Yes. Yes, and it, because it didn't wood, have the, the steering wheel was made out of wood too, I believe. Uh, I yeah. remember. That. Yeah, it was a and it was a big steering wheel, so it was yes. a big wheel for me as a little girl. So, oh yeah, but that's how I learned how to drive. Because uh, I was like, nothing works. The night the numbers are not moving. He's like, it's all broken. You got to figure it out. Go with the feel, girl. Well, <laughs> that's an example where a parent, in this case a grandparent, had confidence in you that you would figure it out and gave you responsibility. That's a lot of things that we unfortunately take from kids. We we don't want to give them a responsibility. And in my book, Learning, I, I say, well, if the first responsibility you give a kid is when they get out of college and expect them to be responsible, well, you're 20 years too late. Yeah. Yeah. You got you got to get them when they're young. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, so and Gary, case, if anybody was, wanted, Gary, if anybody wanted to get your book, where could they get your book? Uh, relating to ancients.com is, is you can get all my books, uh, virtually all my books. The, the old one, uh, it's available for free on researchgate.com. But uh, relating to ancients.com is my website. I autograph it there. My New York distributor uh, has my books through. Um, uh, all the library systems get them through Baker and Taylor or Ingram, uh, a wholesale, and then Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all those places uh, can uh, order my books. Uh, obviously, if it comes through my website, I I autograph it and, and send it out. Well, that's awesome. Now, I, do, Thank I, you. I should say that if I send it to Canada, being here in Canada, it costs a lot to send a book uh, because of the postage, the, the, the yep. UPS, FedEx, whatever, it's very costly. So my New York distributor has a system where uh, she takes care of it. And I think uh, my books are now on uh, uh, Amazon in Canada too. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for sitting and having tea with me. It was really amazing. And we went down history and had some memories pop up. And now I, I'm, I'm picturing my car and I miss my car. Uh, <laughs> you know, a good time. You miss the old days. days right? <laughs> yes, they are. They are. We have we have to smile through life, and I think that's what makes life so enjoyable and makes life, as we talked about earlier, interesting. And so, if if people, uh, you know, whether they're rural or city, use their resources and um, you know do a little research on your own, whether it's uh, family matters or a genealogy or or a, a patent, as you talked about, it's yeah. it's up to you. You can do lots of things. You don't have to rely on on expecting somebody else to do that. Do it yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for joining me. And thank you so much for the audience and listeners out there. I could not do this without all of you guys. Uh, so all your support, all your questions, all of your likes and shares do make a difference in Miss Liz's life. I will be back on the 14th and 15th and 17th next week. So it will be a busy week for me, but I have two returning guests that are returning. Uh, Laura, Laura Bellitz coming back with Science of Empowerment. She'll be talking about that. And then we have Ayana Davis coming back, and she'll be talking about autism uh, as a black woman and being diagnosed as an adult. And then we have couples. We have two returning couples that are coming back that are going to be talking about relationship and intimacy. That's what we're going to be talking about. And both couples have been married, I believe, over 30 years. So this is like to bring the couples back. So I have a little bit of everything for everybody out there. So until next week... Stay true, keep serving your tea, and just be yourselves. Miss Liz is watching, and I will reach out to you if I feel that you have a good cup of tea. I'd like to do a special shout-out to Mickey Mickelson as well for giving me my tea time from this morning. From McKay was this afternoon, and they both come from Mickey Mickelson, like a creative edge. Uh, Mickey has amazing authors on there as well. And until then, I will see everybody next week, same time, same place, and we'll do this all over again. Thank you, Liz and, and Mickey for Mickey Mickelson. Thank you for so much, Liz, for having me on. It was a pleasure, Gary.